Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've been studying the book of Genesis on and off over the past year, and we returned a few weeks ago for this beginning of the season of Lent. Um, if you're just joining us, here are a few notes about where we've been and where we are now. Late last year, we studied the story of Noah, which, uh, if you've been reading, is kind of a relaunch of all humanity. Humanity as a whole reaches uh, this incredible low. The text of Genesis 6 says, the thoughts of man's heart were only evil all the time. And so Noah and his family kind of represent this new humanity coming out of the flood. But just a few chapters later, humanity reaches another low point. The Babel account, we read this last week. The Babel account is about humanity building a monument to itself. The text there in Genesis 11 is uh, the people saying, let us make a name for ourselves, for ourselves, like independent from God. Uh, in the prayer of confession, but right before it, we read uh, the, the words of Daniel 9. It's an old prayer, um, where prayer, uh, in Daniel's prayer right at the end, he claims the people of God as the people called by God's name. His name is ours. Uh, there's no separation. Again, um, whatever binds us together, it's God. It's his own breath that we breathe so we don't collapse from asphyxiation. It's his name, his character, his promise that constitutes us as a people, Israel in the Old Covenant, his church in the New. There is no us without him, his name. And yet here we are in Babel, all people saying, let's make a name for ourselves. Instead of needing God to come down to give us life, Let's build our way from here up. And so God, when he looks, it, it really seems uh, in this conversation God's basically having with himself in Genesis 11, this is verses 1 through 9. He says, this is only the beginning of what they're about to do. That's the language of the text. Oh my goodness. It seems like the, the people of the land are, are basically on the verge of building this vast evil empire. And God says, this is only the beginning. And so what does he do? He scatters them. He scatters the people. He confuses their language. And this is, uh, now this, this is a little bit of a side of where we're going today. But this is only one of many examples in Scripture. We've already seen them in Genesis 1 through 11. And there are many more throughout the Old Testament and the New. This is only one instance where a judgment of God, this scattering is actually a mercy, isn't it? 
he does it, it says so, exactly so they won't get worse. This is only the beginning of what they're about to do. And so he passes a judgment of scattering. It's not unlike, if you remember the end of Genesis 3, the people commit a sin, right? Um, We can, instead of offering creation to God, we can make ourselves like him, listening to the sermon, uh, listening to the serpent, that is, and we can offer all creation to ourselves. And if you remember right at the end of Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden, um, the reason why they're exiled, God says, is lest they go back in with this new uncleanness where they kind of esteem themselves equal to me, like trying to build life on their own accord, lest they get back into the garden and eat from the tree of life. And the idea seems to be like, if there's a version of humanity where we're given up into eternal life as the worst versions of ourselves, and the exile from the garden is a merciful judgment so that we are not like this Worst version of ourselves, utterly and forever. Uh, just one later version of this is, if you're familiar with the plague cycle in the, in the book of Exodus, um, Moses and Aaron keep going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no, no way, or yes, and then he retracts it, and maybe, or ultimately no, again and again and again, and God himself says, I think it's like um, plague eight or so, he's like, you know, Pharaoh, you know, I could just like cast a pestilence on you all like that, and it would be done, Why doesn't he do this? It's because he is who he says he is. The most common description, the most common description of God in the Old Testament is, I am merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. It's because it's who he is. So for that reason, he scatters. He scatters them. And into this moment, we get the story of Abram, later to be known as Abraham. Now, you really cannot overstate the significance of Abraham in the story of the people of God. All of the blessings and mercies that come to Israel again and again throughout her history, up to and beyond the coming of Christ, are the outworking of God's promises to this man. God says to Abram, basically, I'm paraphrasing now, If you trust me, if you follow me, the world will be blessed through you. Not you will be awesome for your own sake. This is not what we get in verses 2 and 3 of this promised blessing to Abram. Not you're going to have uh, this vast empire that's for you so you can build another kingdom trying to reach heaven on your own steam. No. If you trust me, if you follow me, then all peoples of the world will be blessed through you because i got to start somewhere. And, you know, there's such a beautiful economy of words through Genesis, and I don't want to go too far, but there are all these questions from silence, particularly in the first 11 or 12 chapters of Genesis. Like, I wonder, did God try anyone else first? And they said no, or they just ignored it. We don't know. We just get through this guy, God appealing, God making an appeal. Through you, I want to bless the world. Out of the scattering of all nations at Babel, God says to this Abram, I don't want to have to scatter. I don't want to have to scatter people in order to restrain their evil. I want to invite them into flourishing communion with me and have them say yes. I am looking for a family that will faithfully go with me on purpose. And that's the first word to Abram in verse 1 of chapter 12, really right in the middle of the text as it's printed here for you, um, the beginning of that fourth paragraph on page 3. In verse 1, the first word of God to Abram is go. Go out from the economies of power and influence that you live in refuse the confidence of Babel, trying to build things on their own steam. And Babel, by the way, doesn't really go anywhere. It's scattered, but some version of Babel keeps popping up throughout the story of Scripture. 
keeps getting revisited. At Babel, she's not gone. She's just regathering her forces to resist and rebel again and always inviting the people of God back. Later, uh, it's expressed as Babylon. And even the church herself, according to the book of Revelation, teams up with Babel a lot to fight against what God's doing. This is a, this is a Bible long story. Go out from there, Abram, and show the world what a life of dependence on God looks like. And you know this is an invitation that's not just from Abram, not just for Abram, that is. This is an invitation that still echoes down to today, to this minute, and it faces you and me. So two points, really simple points as we look at the rest of these verses from Genesis 1, chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 7. God's call and Abram's response, the nature of God's call and the nature of Abram's response. First, God's call. We get it in verses 1 through 3 of Genesis 12. Uh, What you have to see about God's call to Abram is that it's really costly. I thought I sent an email. I did not send an email. It's not Harrison's fault who helps us with with the PowerPoint of a map of where Abram's going, and we'll include it next week. Basically, um, if you're familiar with the the Middle East range of the Fertile Crescent, uh, if you can picture uh, this part of the world map, that'll help. If you can't, just search engine it after the service. Um, Ur, where, where Abram comes out of, not far from that was Babel, is all the way down, if you're familiar with the Arabian Peninsula, where Saudi Arabia is, north of there, near Iran, um, near the the Arabian Sea, there's this curve um, called the Fertile Crescent that goes all the way up through modern-day Iraq, through southwestern Turkey and northwestern uh, Syria, down through Jordan. We're over by the Mediterranean Sea now, and all the way down to Israel. Ur starts at this side of that crescent. And Abram's family, it looks like his father, Terah, was the first one called by God to go, actually. That's the language of Genesis 11. Terah brings his children out, but then they settle in Haran, which with Ur, where they started, are two of the main cultural centers in Mesopotamia. I mean, this is where it was really flourishing in the ancient world. Um, like, if you're familiar with the, 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 the ancient civilizations of Sumer, Sumerian culture, or Akkad, I mean, this is where it was at. These were the wealthy centers. This is where commerce was happening. It's also where a ton of idolatry was happening. And it, it was a region called Mesopotamia, which just means land of two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. This, this, this green flourishing area at the time that went all the way up north to Haran, which is where they settled, and then goes down, or the arc of it goes down towards Israel. At any rate, leaving these regions was not a good life plan on your own. These are two of the three greatest centers of trade in Mesopotamia. It cost him influence, comfort, and introduced him into obscurity. So it's a costly call. It's also an uncertain call of God. He's leaving his people. He's leaving the life his father had established. And it's not like there's an insurance policy in the ancient world. Like, this is dangerous travel to a land that you don't know. And aside from the journey itself, what would happen to him when he got here in Canaan, the future land of Israel? What would happen to him when he got there? There's nothing about this trip that Abram can control. And there's no confidence at all except for one thing, that God is for him and with him. It's a costly and uncertain call. You know, when you see a a figure in Scripture called to do something by God, it can be a little bit difficult to apply. Here's what I mean. Um, Abram gets a call. What was it like? Did God whisper in his ear? Did he send a prophet? Was it a lightning bolt? Was it just like a feeling he had in his gut that maybe he should go? We don't know in this text. Most of the time, though, now there are direct calls. It's unmistakable to people in the scriptures. But most of the time God leads people to do something, it's actually not something like that in scripture. Did you know there's actually a biblical grid that you and I can use 
In the event that God himself does not whisper in your ear, there's a biblical grid that any of us can use all the time. Now, I can't go through this exhaustively, although we did do a sermon series on this like seven years ago. The different ways, according to scripture, you can discern that you're called by God to do something. And I'll give them to you real briefly right now. God's word, God's people, God's providence, and God's spirit. I'll go through them really briefly, a brief version of each. First of all, God's word. Like, we know that the, the word of God calls us to do some things, like love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength in your neighbor as yourself. Love God. You don't have to wonder if you're called to do that. You also know that you're called not to do something, like say the Ten Commandments. Like, don't have other gods, don't worship idols, don't take his name in vain, don't, you know, honor authority, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't, don't covet things that aren't yours. Like, you don't have to wonder that. Those are things you're called to do and to be, God's word. Like, you're not starting from nothing here. You're not just walking out into the, in, into the air and saying, I'm just going to see what I feel like, like I'm called to do today. There's not, like, nothing. That's God's word. Secondly, God's people You know, the Apostle Paul, when he had that Damascus Road experience, which was like vivid and confirmed by a few people at the time, he's going to murder Christians. Christ himself stops him and says, why are you persecuting me? And he spends three days blind and then comes to his sight again and begins being an apostle for Jesus. Now that happened and it was a big deal, but you know what he still did? He went to those who were apostles. This is according to Galatians chapter 2. He went to like Peter and John and James, and he said, hey, am I just like way out in left field here with my theology? And they said, no, we confirm the grace of God given to you. You actually should be doing this. You should keep being a mouthpiece for Jesus in your generation. So like God's people, if they're saying to you, if, if people in your life who are Christian or Christians are saying things like encouraging you to do something or kind of warning you, you shouldn't act like that's nothing. It's very common in Scripture. So God's word, God's people. Thirdly, God's providence. Is he closing doors you can't open? Is he opening doors you can't avoid walking through? Again, the Apostle Paul several times, I'm thinking about his letters to the Corinthians. He's like, I wanted to go, I really wanted to go and stop in Macedonia for a long time, but uh, I just didn't have peace about it. Or I just, there was just something in my way and I couldn't get there. You You don't take just one, you take the whole grid. And finally, fourthly, the Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. It's interesting. Paul says, I didn't have peace peace about going to see you. I didn't have peace about going to Troas in a different place. Well, where is the spirit of God start and what I want to do end? I, I don't know, but it's not the only one. It's not the only part of the grid. I throw that out to you because this is only, uh, this is only the first time we have to try to apply in the Bible. This is the first book of the Bible now, if you didn't know. This is only the first time we have to try to apply. What does it mean that God might call us or me to do something? And there's a grid. But for the main point today, you know what's never, never, never a criteria for whether or not God is calling you to do something? Whether it will cost you. It will always cost you. And that's the first lesson from the life of Abram. It'll absolutely cost you. There's no question. The only question we ask in our hearts is, is it worth it? I don't know if you've recognized yet the similarity between the call of Abram and when Jesus, later in the Gospels, calls his first disciples to follow him. Thinking about Mark 1, Matthew 4, Luke 5, John 1. Jesus says things like, come and see. Follow me. And you see Peter leaving everything to follow Jesus. You see John and James, the sons of Zebedee. It says they're on the boat with their father, Zebedee, fishing. And Jesus calls them. And they leave everything, including their father's house. Just like Abram to follow Christ. 
And Christ spends years inviting them to consider whether life on his terms is actually worth it. Come and see. And here's the thing, and this is for a thousand other sermons. It's costly. But when Christ calls you to follow him, he never asks you to trade down. It's not like he's asking you to take a greater life and exchange it for a lesser one. There's a cost. It's the cost of letting it go to trust him into the unknown. But Christ's dare is for us to believe it's healthier, it's more beautiful, it's more fulfilling, it's more glorious than anything we've known before. Same with Abram. There's uh, an old advertisement from a guy some of you might know of uh, named Ernest Shackleton. He led the first semi-successful expedition to Antarctica. And uh, on the way to beginning the expedition, he put an ad in the paper trying to put together a crew to travel sea to sea through Antarctica and around it. This is what the advertisement said. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And he expected zero responses, and he got over 300. That's the call. And you got to wait for the rest of the story to find out if it was worth it. Secondly, Abram's response. That's God's call. Cling to me. Please, one family that I don't have to scatter to be merciful to them. One family that will follow me on purpose and trust me that I'm clinging clinging to them more than they're clinging to me anyway, and that it'll be totally worth it and bless the world. Just one family. Could I get one? That's the call. Secondly, Abram's response. The response is yes, um, but a few observations, a few adjectives to describe this yes. First, it's a simple yes. Verse four. Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Verse 4 just says, Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. So God says go, Abram goes. Precious little is said about what direction he should go in, what he should be looking for. But what I'm trying to say is the simplicity seems to be the point. It's a very simple obedience. In verses 1 through 9, which I know takes us beyond the exact verses we're reading today, the text says he went using six different terms to describe the same thing. He departed, he set forth, he had come, he passed through, he moved on, he journeyed on. The point seems to be the going. It's a simple yes. But here's another thing. It's an active yes. It is not a spoken yes. He doesn't say, yes, I will. He just goes. What is recorded for us is the yes with his feet. The yes with his feet. He actually goes. You know, I think that there is this misconception about faith, and this is for those of you who perhaps have been a Christian a little bit longer. Insiders of the church, let's say. How do we come to Christ? Well, we come to him by faith. I think that there is a a little bit of a misconception about what faith is sometimes. The idea is out there that faith is just some agreements in our head with God about the true things we need to believe. You know, the Apostle James says the demons have that truth in their heads about God and about Christ. The demons have it too. So there has to be something qualitatively different that separates our faith from the demons' faith, right? And it's the yes of our feet. No, there will never be a good work you can point to in boast. This is Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 9. You're never going to boast before God in heaven, saying, like, I'm here because I did this awesome thing. And that said, absolutely integrated into your faith is faithfulness. Actually, in Greek, they're the same word, and that's not an accident, both in the verbal and in the noun form. You can't separate faith from obedience. You just can't do it. You know the parable from Jesus where he says, you know, there was one guy whose master called him to go, and he said yes, and then he didn't go. And then there's the master, the same master called this other servant to go, and he said no, and then went anyway. (laughs) 
Which one was obedient? Which one actually had faith? You answer your own question. That is the faith of Abraham. It's a yes with his feet. Eugene Peterson has a great quote. He says, faith is trusting obediently. That's faith, trusting obediently. You need both. Trusting obediently in someone we cannot control, living in obedient relationship to the one we cannot see, venturing obediently into a land that we know nothing about. I've heard it described helpfully as something like allegiance. Faith, as the scriptures speak about it, is allegiance. You know how you say, sometimes or maybe some of you don't, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Does that mean just I agree mentally with the idea that the flag is out there and I'm somehow a citizen of it? I mean, don't say it if you don't mean it. Don't ever say anything you don't mean. Ever. <laughs> what you're saying is, I am aligned and I follow. That's what you're saying. I am aligned with this mind, heart, and body all the way down. That's the faith of Abraham. Eventually, Abram gets more confirmation. This is the very end of the passage. Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram. I would love to talk more about what it means that the Lord appears to people who can't get there now. There'll be other opportunity further on in Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Okay, you're here now. This is the place. And then Abram does something very, very significant and interesting, which we've seen already in the book of Genesis through the life of Noah. He builds an altar. He builds an altar. If you didn't know, what is an altar exactly? Altars are the places where sacrifices are made. Altars are places of relinquishment. I put a sacrifice on the altar. It's yours now. It's yours now. Um, it's transformed in the offering. You make of it whatever you want. I've surrendered it. It's not mine anymore. It's yours. And of course... It's more than just the animal that's sacrificed. It's something like your life. Something valuable, right? Not something you're going to trash. Not something worthless. Altars are places of relinquishment. This is Abram saying, he went with his feet. Now he's using his hands. Now he's using his bank. Altars are places of offering what you have to God like Shackleton's advertisement about Antarctica. The cost, uncertainty, the relinquishment of this journey probably resonates with every adventure story you've ever read. A hero goes on a journey. There's uncertainty. You wouldn't read it otherwise or watch it, whether it's true or fictional. Would it be any different for the story which Christians stake our lives on being true? Will this faith cost us nothing? Will there be no moment of uncertainty? We hedge all the time to defend against any discomfort. And the story of Abram just says again and again, that's not our faith. That's telling you a true story all along about who your God really is hedging against any discomfort that he might call you to. That's not our faith. You cannot drag all the comforts that you know or have known into this faith journey, and neither can I, despite the many times that I try. Let me end like this, folks. The altar is a place of radical yes to God. Yes. Yes, I will go where you lead me. Yes, I will trust you, even though I can't totally see the way. Yes, I believe that your way is better than mine, even though it will be uncomfortable. But here's the interesting thing of Abraham's story, and i got to humanize him for you, and maybe you'll thank me for this. I thank God for when we get to this next part of his story, and this is for next week. The altar is the place of Abram's radical yes to God, but it's also the very place. This is why I stopped at verse 7. The altar building place is also the place where God shows Abraham that he has absolutely no idea what it actually means to live a life of faith, to say yes to him. 
if up till now we see like this righteous Abram doing everything right, you say, go, I go. I get there, I build an altar. The next passage is God showing Abram, you didn't really realize what yes to me meant, did you? And if you did, you probably never would have started this journey in the first place. We get to be like Abram in that way too. He's not just a hero. He's also a person who needs grace. The story of Abram, later Abraham, shows again and again that in our relationship with God, we are not the main ones who are faithful, necessary as our faith is. He is the main one who is faithful. His grip on us is so much stronger than our grip on him. His grip on us is so much stronger than our grip on him. Let me end like this on the note of altars. Um, You know the symbol of the cross. You know the symbol of the cross. What's the cross? The cross actually means many things. It's kind of like light, like white light. You can hold a prism up to it, and you see all these different colors diffusing from it. That's like the cross. The cross is, on one hand, it's an instrument of death that the Romans used to crush rebels and to strike fear into the hearts of anyone who would ever consider crossing Rome. Christians, the cross is the means by which God takes away the sins of the world, if you know the story of the gospel. In one person, Jesus Christ is the God of glory and also the spotless, innocent human being whose self-offering covers the impurities of the world, offers total washing and forgiveness, making a way for a world of sinners to draw near a holy God. As John the Baptist says, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That happens at the cross. Here's one other thing the cross is, though, and I don't know if you knew this. The cross is an altar. Remember what an altar is. It's a place where sacrifices are made. At the cross, Jesus renounced all. He gave it all to God, the Father. He gave it all to God the Father. And was it a waste? Only through the human eyes of looking at, the human way of looking at things. It actually led to a blessing that no one at the foot of the cross could have comprehended that day. Salvation of the nations. The promise to Abram coming true. And the call to every Christian who is saved by this Christ is to join him at this altar. Do you actually believe that the best thing you could do with your life is give it back to God and find out how he'll use it to bless the world? In all of the uncertainty that is is involved with that, do you believe that that's true? That the best thing you could do with your life is give it back to God and see how he might use it to bless the world. If we believe that's true, what will our lives look like? Brothers and sisters, offer your lives to him. He's better at holding it than we are. Take your hands off of it and just see what he will do with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.